So today we're at Jake's house and we're gonna be talking about basements and specifically why they're so expensive and what's going on behind us because it's an exciting day. So let's get to it. So today we're with Craig Novak, the project manager for Jake's house and Craig, I'd love to know what's going on here because we got a lot of things going on and honestly, it's a little bit confusing. So can you explain to me what's going on with the wood on the horizontal aspect as well as the vertical aspect and then, you know, what's going on? So from our transition from a mass slab, we start constructing the vertical walls. And the vertical walls have a plywood interior face on both sides, but until they get to the, all the steel gets tied on the interior, then they'll start constructing the other face of the interior. What we see out here is uh, back bracing on the back of the plywood and inside there's a device called a snap tie. It's a rod that has dimensional uh, stops with, that'll hold the form at 10 inches. And then these cam locks or cowbells are placed to hold that snap tie snug to the form and allow the strong back bracing of all the two bys to hold that plywood from flexing so your concrete gets poured in a true uh, solid flat surface. The vertical lines um, are in order for us to be able to push and pull the form so it's brought true to the lines. The lines were set by the surveyors. They give you fixed points that allow us to know where the house is placed off the property line. Uh, they'll be coming later today and they'll determine and certify that our foundation is exactly where it's supposed to be and they'll give us a letter that we can provide to the local municipality. The plywood that I see on the other side of the two by fours, that's actually forms the outside of the wall or the concrete is poured against that? That's actually the form for the wall that the concrete is poured against. And then okay. we'll, and once these forms are removed, all this work is actually backed out after the concrete is in place. And then we'll be able to do all the additional waterproofing and finishes on the outside of the walls. Okay, so the, all the wood goes away and the two by fours, which are going horizontally, so those pieces of wood going horizontally, are to keep the wall straight in a, in a longitudinal manner. Is that right? Correct. Okay. True to itself along the same plane as the string line. Okay. And then the vertical ones are to keep it straight up and down. Is that right? Right. And it allows us with this turnbuckle to push and pull it so it ends up precisely on that string line. Okay. So that's what that's what all this row of, of rods back here is. Yeah. So it's, what did you call them? Kickers? Kickers. Yeah. Okay. It's a kicker brace and it allows us to push and pull that wall so it uh, ends up exactly plumb. Okay, and then that's what this string is that I've tripped over a couple times right here is. is all about forming a straight line because a string is gonna go straight from, and what is this thing behind you called? Uh, the batter boards are a reference point for the height of the floor, okay. and also the positioning of the uh, surveyor's mark. Okay. So that's how they, they identify where that string starts and finishes and between two points, a straight line is can be pulled on a string as long as it's intense. And then that won't move for the whole duration of the job while these guys are, are working around it. Right. Okay. But if it had been kicked at some time, the surveyors would be able to tell us, hey, move that wall just a little bit so okay. they get true to that point. And you said later today, we're going to expect the surveyors to come back here and he's going to use what tools to determine kind of where everything is laid? We'll use a theodolite that'll give us a, uh, the quadrant locations that will tell us precisely where we are on the property according to all their measurements that they've placed outside the property. Okay, so you mentioned theodolite. Is that, is that that thing that sits on a tripod that they look through that looks like the scope on a gun? Yeah, so okay. that, that, that gives them the ability to measure and refer to GPS locations that are cross-referenced. Okay, so it's all defined by by something in the street uh, that defines exactly the elevation and location so that we're not within the setbacks on the front or the back or the sides of the property because that would be a big problem for the cities, right? Oh, absolutely. So the team that is surveying and certifying actually had to start about 500 yards away and bring those dimensions towards the property so that they're secure, that their reference points are solid when they are going to sign a certification. Okay, so then all of that work is done by other people before the foundation guys ever get here. And then when the foundation guys get here, they drop those lines directly from the surveyor's mark 
to define exactly where the house is. Correct. Okay. So they're given a top floor elevation and they're also giving offsets from the corners that the foundation team tells them where they want those marks to be placed so that they know they're out of their work zone. Okay. So then that is basically the, the kind of beginning of phase of laying out a foundation. Is that only for basements or is it for all types of foundations? All types of foundations. Okay. Yeah, not necessarily basements. You can just have any type of footing okay. or uh, your post. Okay. So then I see a whole lot of stuff going on inside. Can we go back in there and look? Absolutely. Then we'll be able to see the snap ties and then all the mesh and rebar grid that they've had to put in place. Awesome. Great. So we're here in the in the bottom of the basement as it's really being formed and foundation and kind of the heart of the action. And we're standing in front of a bunch of rebar with some kind of crazy looking gizmos in our hands. So Craig, tell me what this, what this is. Well, the core of the system is a, a snap tie system. So there's these green cones are what keep the form from compressing on itself. It gives us that 10 inch spacing. And you can see the example here. So this one is locked in outside on those two by fours that we saw earlier. And then when the plywood is set on the interior, this cone will be able to stop it in position. And okay. then the other device you have in your hand, they call a spider. And the example of that being in use is keeping the rebar in the back off the wall at its exact distance. So that has to go back here and get it gets tied to the rebar to keep the rebar from coming too close to the... To the exterior plywood or, or the plywood on the end. So why is that important? The, the engineer is determining how much concrete has to be around these pieces of rebar. So if it gets too close and you don't get the coverage, you have a potential for the rebar rusting and spalling the concrete, which is damaging. And also you get your most strength having the rebar in this precise position. Got it. So this little gizmo is actually really, really important to the structural integrity of the entire foundation. Absolutely. And the rebar is positioned correctly at the base, but you have to make sure it has that continuum all the way up the wall. Got and it. These walls are 14 feet high, so they're, they're okay. needing to have reference points to, to tie everything okay. together. So I noticed that like there's different sizes of rebar. So rebar is sized differently. How, like, what is this rebar versus this rebar? And why is this one so much larger than this one? So rebar is measured in, in eight, eighth inch increments. The verticals are for this to resist the thrust of the soils from the exterior. Because we live in a very high seismic region of uh, San Francisco Bay, um, we, we have to design for earthquakes. Okay. So this isn't really what we would see in, say, a, a basement in Missouri or Alabama or something like that. This is a lot stronger? Yeah, they, they wouldn't go to this extent. There, okay. It'd be uh, a little less and maybe thinner rebar. Okay. And so would they also, I see that we have two mats of rebar. So can you explain to me why we have two mats of rebar? Because I watch a lot of videos on YouTube about foundations and stuff, and I see very often like maybe one of these rebar going vertically or horizontally and then others vertically, but I never see two mats. Why do we have two mats here? It, it all goes back to the engineering again. It's, it's a matter of what flexation they need in case of a seismic event. Okay. So these, these actually hold that wall in resistance and tension. So okay. So rebar is for tension or compression? Tension. Okay. Yeah. And why is it, is it not also for compression or is concrete do that? Concrete will take the compression as well as the wood framing that we're going to have in, inside of these walls okay. because we're doing a passive house. We have a, a extensive insulation in these basement walls. But we also have insulation on the outside walls and un insulation underneath the slab. Correct. Underneath the mat slab. Yeah. Okay. So then rebar is really 100% designed by the structural engineer according to the code and the requirements of that specific project for how much rebar it's going to need in every specific portion of the foundation based largely on seismic events in this area. Correct. Okay. So they take the soils calculations, design the foundation, and then the soil engineer actually has to prove, approve their foundation that they design. Oh, wow. Because of the uh, layers of qualification that they all have. Okay. So they're the experts in how this is going to move and why. Okay, so then how come this rebar stops here? Whereas if you look around the rest of the basement, there's actually rebar all the way up to the top of the walls. Well, for the, the working height, because this bar actually comes down and turns 90 degrees into the mat slab. So the, the lengths of rebar have to be manageable. Uh, so this is so the workers can handle it because it gets very heavy, especially at the scale. Yep. Uh, and then they're able to uh, sister on pieces to get more vertical elements.
okay. to reach the top of this foundation. So they'll put another piece of rebar kind of like this and they'll actually match it to this and then they'll use this wire to tie it so that it can goes up to the top? Correct, and there's the, depending on the girth, it gives you the overlap distance that's necessary to tie. So next... even, even this dimension on where this overlaps with this bar is determined by the structural engineer? Absolutely. Okay. So their overlap, if they need to overlap, they weren't able to do this in one piece, then the overlap is described in the plans. Okay. And then, so why, so we're gonna have more rebar coming up here, and the reason that we're not higher up here is because they just haven't put it in yet. Correct, so okay. the team is working in the back, you have rebar specialists that are tying the continuing on the verticals, as well as the horizontal elements. So we have several phases of that in motion right now. See, the group is putting the horizontals first, then they're able to tie those verticals to those horizontals. Oh. And we have a great example on the far side of the basement here right now. So when this whole wall is done, how thick is it gonna be? This is a 10-inch basement wall. Wow, so that this is all filled with concrete and they pour the concrete from the very top all the way down. Now I see a groove down here on the bottom. So what's that groove for? It's called a water stop. So there's a couple types of ways. So right here. Yeah, let me give you so There's some. water filling it right now. Well, it's stopping that one. Okay, well, there you go. Uh, and there's a, a polyurethane element that goes in there that stops any potential water movement across. Oh. But we've wrapped this entire foundation with a water stop. So that's system. like a gasket. Yes. So why is the gasket there at the, at the base of the slab and the base of the wall? Why is it there and not everywhere else? Because we poured the mass slab separate from the walls, okay. that's a start and stop point, which is called a cold joint. So okay. anytime you have a cold joint, you have to treat it with some type of material. Is that because water, water can come through Water can, can potentially come through there. Okay. But in this, in this case with this basement, the water table is probably another 18 feet below. Oh, wow. Okay. The foundation. So we, we feel very strongly that the system that's been designed for here and the system to bring the water away from the foundation is absolutely capable. Okay. And we know it's 18 feet down because the geotech drilled that far and, and found water down there. Correct. Okay. That's great. So then, you know, I think we've learned a lot at this point about the foundation. And I think that, you know, I, what we've seen is that really everything is defined by the structural engineer. Absolutely. Right. Based on the geotech design. Right. Yeah. He's designing towards what the geotech okay. study proved. Okay. Awesome. As you see, we have a lot of things going on in this project, and we're going to have a lot more videos to come as we go through things like pouring the concrete, the ventilation and drainage. So we want to make sure you don't miss any. So make sure you subscribe as we show you how to build a better way.